Hi, Lacey. Thank you for coming to talk to me about a really, really important topic. Hello. Thanks for having me today. So you are um, a therapist. Is that right? Yes. And um, I've asked you to talk to me because you specialize in working with uh, people who are either you know, pregnant or postpartum mm -hmm. um, and and people who are having issues related to trauma, past trauma, um, and how that affects their, their daily lives. And um, in particular today, how it affects their experience with pregnancy and birth and recovery afterwards. So I'd love to ask you some questions about this. Absolutely. Absolutely. Is there anything else that you would like people to know about you? Yeah, I would just tell you, I yes, I'm a therapist in uh, Southwest Austin. We do telehealth as well, but I am I'm a licensed professional counselor. Started off, uh, I'm a registered play therapist as well. My first bit of career was working with kids, um, some adults, but then after kind of going through my own experience, um, just knowing then how important it was to have people who understand perinatal mental health, all that can go into uh, pregnancy and postpartum. Um, it just really stood out to me of like, that's a direction I want to go. So then I started working more um, with, with adults and the intersection well, always, when I worked with kids, I worked with sexually abused kids and I could see even then how um, teenagers were talking about in the future, what is this going to be like for me that I've had this experience? What about me having my own kids? And it just really got me thinking and noticing how much trauma even before we um, ever get to the point of thinking about having kids is um, it's, it's there and it, it impacts it. Um, so I think it's a really important to uh, topic to address that because it's not just trauma that happens in birth um, or childbirth, that's birth trauma. That's one thing, but all the trauma from before <laughs> is, is definitely subject to come up um, during that process. And that can be shocking to a lot of people because not a lot of people expect that. They think, oh, I, I've, maybe I've worked on this in the past or it never really was an issue. And then all of a sudden here it is. And yeah. So. Yeah. Pregnancy and birth can trigger things. Mm -hmm. and, and when it's your first time, how would you know? Right. right. Absolutely. Okay, so do you want to start just by talking about what trauma is? Yeah, so yeah, trauma is, you know, can be any event or series of events that you've gone through that uh, threaten that you perceive they are an actual threat to your life or perceive as a threat to your life or your integrity, your safety. There's lots of different ways um, that can come out it can happen in a single event or just repeated events. And, and it also really depends on how you feel you're supported through those things that that can then again, make a, a situation or event traumatic. The first thing I want to say about trauma is it's, it is a subjective experience. Um, so if someone says like, I went through that, and it was traumatic, then it was, it was traumatic. Um, and we, we need to hear that from people because again, it all comes down to their perception and how they feel they were supported or taken care of during those moments. Um, so while I give um, examples here in a second, one of the first things I want to say, I know you and I had talked about like how, uh, prevalent trauma is and the National Council for Mental um, Well-Being estimates, and you can kind of see this in other um, agencies reports as well, is approximately 70% of adults have experienced some kind of trauma, uh, at least one traumatic event in their life. So we're talking about this can hurt, happen from, from early on, even when their uh, parents were pregnant with them was there something going on complications in birth or right after, or even, um, you know, Nikki visits can be traumatic for someone early on. Then we're talking about um, attachment. There can be attachment trauma, um, having parents maybe not as connected or not as able to take care of baby in the way that they're, um, that a baby is needing. And, other things like complex trauma, um, children who go through a lot of abuse or neglect, not being taken care of, not supported. Again, I talk about that, you know, that perception of like, am I, am I being taken care of? Am I valuable as a person to, um, you know, housing or food insecurity, um, 
and other things that kind of stand out for a lot of people, you know, that we know is like um, car accidents, uh, witnesses to violence, a natural disaster, even going through a really scary natural disaster and, and losing, you know, uh, valuables or having to be um, displaced from your home for a bit. You know, there's some people who definitely go through a lot bigger traumas of um, when we're thinking about immigrants, um, people who are maybe needing to flee for safety. Um, all of those things can definitely come back up and with someone not feeling um, very safe during pregnancy or childbirth. Other things, uh, sexual trauma, definitely. That's a big one that I see come up a lot. And Medical trauma, someone who's in and out of the hospital a lot with chronic illnesses, um, always having to deal with different procedures can be very um, difficult. So then I see people that are going through uh, IVF, that being really triggering too. It comes up again. Um, it may trigger some of their own uh, trauma from the past or come up again in their birth because they're going through all those procedures, always feeling like you know people around them trying to figure out what's going on with their bodies. Um, an important thing we need to look at for a lot of people is racial trauma, discrimination, chronic stress that comes from that, that can easily be triggered again in the, uh, the delivery room or at the birth center or whatever, uh, maybe however people are delivering, um, to things that happen in labor and delivery. And those can be re-triggered again for people who are having go through subsequent pregnancies just because, you know, they've gone through it before and they know what to expect <laughs> doesn't mean it might not be traumatic again when they go through it. So um, anything that can happen in delivery, and we might get to that. I think that's maybe in another question that we have later, I'll discuss um, what we can look at that. So that's just kind of the very quick, it's not exhaustive lifts, but the big types of traumas that we can see um, that come up again for people in the perinatal period. Yeah. And some of those are a really clear, there's a really clear connection, right? Obviously if someone has been sexually assaulted or abused, um, then being in this setting, you know, being maybe in a hospital where, um, you know, they're, they're, they're giving birth and maybe they're being asked to, um, consent to a cervical check, a vaginal exam, um, where someone's touching them and where they, um, maybe don't feel as in control of things. I mean, that's, that's, that's more obvious, right? That connection between the, the trauma and what's currently happening, mm -hmm. the past trauma and what's currently happening. Um, but then, but then, like you said, there's other things, there's other things that aren't as such a, such a direct and obvious connection. Um, you know, as a, as a small child, if you were neglected or, or not taken care of, then this lack of control, because when you're a kid, you don't have control over, your life. And so, you know, they may have issues around that. And then getting into this medical care setting where sometimes um, people are treated in a way where they feel like they don't have as much control. Absolutely. Yeah. The big thing you're talking about is like this, this lack of control or this sense of powerlessness. That's one of the big indicators of like a traumatic event for someone is they had no power in the situation, had no say so over what was happening. Um, and so a lot of those, you had mentioned that even if they were asked to consent to a cervical check, sometimes people aren't asked for consent. They're just like, okay, we're going to do a cervical check now. If even that, you know, some people have even reported, oh yeah, just all of a sudden there was a cervical check and I had no idea it was happening. And yeah. that's another form of trauma that happens for a lot of people is, um, you know, with, even with um, medical providers that, didn't give that consent or, or ask for the consent or even give like what we, you know, this informed consent of like, what's happening, what's going to happen next. Yes. So feeling left out or not um, part of the, the equation, um, part of any of the choices. So if there's ever a way we talk about when I do trainings on trauma informed care and how to help people do that in the delivery room is anytime we can give someone choice informed consent, um, just knowledge of what's about to happen and support that's going to help reduce being re-traumatized. So that's when you're providing training to the healthcare providers, the practitioners, mm -hmm. trauma-informed training for them. So they know how to work with people in a way that will be least likely to trigger those past traumas. Yeah. Yeah. So important. And I think that, you know, in philosophy um, and ethically, our, our, our care system is set up 
to do that. I mean, there are laws related to, like you said, informed consent. Um, and when those kinds of guidelines are being followed, it's better. But like you said, sometimes they're not being followed and that's not necessarily the fault of the care provider. Um, that maybe they didn't receive the training. Yeah. Maybe they um, haven't received the training in a long time. Maybe yeah. they are working, they're understaffed and overworked yes. and overtired and things get missed. And so this idea of providing trauma-informed training um, for medical staff, for the providers of care um, is great for everyone uh, mm -hmm. because, you know, nobody wants, nobody wants for the patients to feel those things. Right. Absolutely. And I don't think anyone ever is, you know, intending to, to harm anyone or re-traumatize. And I know that sometimes too, when we, you come to unexpected things that are happening and the focus is let's, let's make everyone safe here. Um, we're human. And when we go into our own like stress trauma state as a provider, we're not always kind of using this part of our brain that tells us, Oh, let's, let's do this or this or that, or we're not always thinking about it and things can happen. But if, if we do have more training around, you know, trauma informed care, and that just means like, let's expect if 70% of adults have had a traumatic event in their life, that, whoever your encounter is probably had some kind of trauma in their life. So then if we can start priming ourselves and making it more of a standard of practice to, you know, do those things, like I said, informed consent, um, letting know what's happening, just communicating, talking out loud and giving choices, then it can be more likely that it, that it happens. Um, and like you said before, at the time when the person is experiencing that original trauma, um, an event can be experienced as traumatic if that person doesn't feel supported. So, um, and, but that's the same for being re-traumatized or triggered, right? Mm -hmm. um, you're less likely to feel triggered or to experience that trauma come back up when you feel well supported by the people around you, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, there's so much, um, but it's also so simple too, in a way, right? It's just, it, does, it feels that way and I, it, it's simple, but then yet so much can come into it. And I, I think that's one of the things too, people are like, well, you know, how would I know? Cause you said some of it seems like, oh, it may be obvious that if I have sexual trauma, then when I go in and have these, these visits, that some of that stuff may be re-triggering. And some people still like, are like, oh my gosh, I had no idea that that was so connected, not realizing how much um, emotion and memory we carry in our bodies, how trauma is stored in our body. Um, it's not something we're always just thinking about. So then their minds are blown to of like, wow, all of a sudden I was back into feeling like this thing was happening again. And we can definitely touch on that here in a second of like, what does um, symptoms of trauma look like? How would you indicate or know that maybe you're being, you know, feeling trauma again through the experience? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I guess I meant simple as far as oh, the, yeah, no, no. <laughs> the provider side of things, yeah. you know, um, I think a lot of times, people um, who are working in these fields feel overwhelmed by you know, all there is to think about and do for their patients and they want to keep everybody safe and healthy. And so that's a huge load to bear also. But then, you know, having to consider um, their emotional state and yeah, what's yeah. going on um, seems maybe even more overwhelming. Like, I, I'm not a, you know, I'm not a trained therapist. I'm not a psychologist. Like, I don't, I don't know how to learn all this. Um, but like you said, it's really just boils down to like three simple things, right? Informed consent, communication, um, and, you know, talking people through things and giving choices, you know, yeah. providing that, you know, that's piece of that informed consent is offering alternatives. Um, and, and, you know, just kind of checking those boxes uh, right. goes a long way. Absolutely. So, um, you know, I think that that all providers um, can maybe feel some relief that maybe it's not as difficult as it might sound mm -hmm. to become really well informed here. And yeah, be totally. See what you're saying. Yes, it, absolutely. If if we can just shift just even a couple things, it really can go a long way. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Um, okay, so you talked about some examples of the kinds of things that people um, will often. Um, 
that might, you know, lead to some issues during pregnancy or labor and birth. Um, so if you kind of understand that you've got some of these um, things in your past, um, then do you think it's a good idea to seek help during pregnancy and what kind? Uh, of course. So as, as a therapist, I do, I think therapy is great uh, when, when you're struggling. And it also is one of those things that can be initiated when you feel like you're not struggling with something. When we look at the transition of um, possible parenthood for the first time or doing, uh, having more children, um, whether or not that journey, because it's, it's definitely easier for some than it is for others. But I think that anytime you're getting ready for that, we have big adjustments in our life, old traumas, old coping skills that maybe we use that um, helped us in the past that maybe aren't the, the most healthy in the future, um, or a lot of anxiety, things like that, that we used to rely on can tend to come up again. And being as you know, <laughs> some people really are ready for the the parenting journey and they've been trying for a long time. For some people, it's unexpected and they're like, okay, here we go. Either way, it is one of the biggest adjustments that, you know, you'll, you'll go through. Um, and with that, it's, it's going to be hard um, as, as I think, there's expectations around what it'll be like. And when those expectations are like, oh, this is not what I expected, that can make you feel really like, you know, again, powerless and out of control and inadequate. So I do think that even just going to talk about how do I get ready for this? Um, what's it like to adjust to pregnancy? What can I expect in childbirth? Um, and then that person, because what I do as well, when people are coming in, I'm a trauma-informed person. So that means that I'm already clued into, yeah, this person probably has some kind of trauma. So I'm like, let's let's go over what type of events have happened in your life and would you consider traumatic? And then I can start doing some groundwork around, hey, here's how that might come up or how I've noticed that coming up for other people going through the process. And then from there, you can say, now, is there a doula that you're working with that I can talk to, who is your, um, your provider, or your midwife, that maybe then we can start talking with the care team about um, what to expect and how to help with the incomes. And then, um, you know, whereas I do have people who know that that's a lot of what I do, and they're like, hey, had a traumatic birth, or I know I had sexual abuse, I know all these things may come up, I want to work with you so we can start to make that plan to reduce um, you know, because I'm getting scared about labor and delivery, which a lot of people do, right? When they don't know what to expect. So, yeah. so. I think everybody does. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit, at least a little bit, even if it's just like, oh, I heard I might poop while I'm pushing the baby yeah. out. I'm scared of that, right? Even if it's just that. Yeah. Um, okay. So then, you, you know, you're working with people to help prepare them for some of these things, kind of fortify them. Um. What, what are some of examples of things that you would recommend that they do preparing for birth? Well, one, again, the first is identify who is your team and is there any way we can all communicate? Um, then I would say, I want you to ask, um, you know, because whether someone's going into a birthing center or a hospital, knowing the things that they might expect with that, especially in a hospital, um, if there's like even laying down in certain positions, can be triggering for someone and that this is in all centers that someone could um, give birth, just helping them be aware of that in a hospital. If there's like, um, you know, stirrups or any type of something that might help hold them back in any way or hold them down wanting to know like, Hey, <laughs> is that something that you want? Can someone let you know before any of that happens? Um, or, knowing what they can expect. And, and and when people can go on a tour of the birthing center or a hospital, I definitely recommend that. So you can start to see like what's in there, noticing how you're feeling, did anything come up then? So we can um, then talk with either a doula or the provider. Cause I know we're not always going to get, if someone is going to an OB's office that they may not get their OB, even when they're at the hospital, just depending on if, you know, <laughs> they're on call, but just knowing, Hey, what are the things that I can say and I can request, or I can communicate um, even on a birth plan. I think having like a trauma birth plan is, is really good. Um, so then that way the providers, the people that are in there will know, and we can be sure it says things like, 
let me know before you touch me. <laughs> let me know before this next, um, you know, intervention or whatever it is, is going to happen. I really want to be informed. I really want to give consent for it. Um, so that I even think that sometimes letting people know too, sometimes some of the sounds or even the smells can really put you back. Like remember I said that trauma is stored in our body. So our senses have a way of like connecting right to something that may not be happening, but it takes you back to a moment. And then all of a sudden, um, you know, this person may find themselves feeling really overwhelmed or feeling triggered and traumatized again. Um, So if there's a way that someone around them, even the, maybe a partner that's going in with them say, you know, it's not everyone has a doula. Um, Can that partner be aware they start to see signs in the body or certain facial expressions or breathing that indicates, Hey, I'm going into a a, a trauma um, response. How can you help bring me back? Is there like a positive um, or like a good smell that they like, like a lavender or an oil or something that makes them feel good? Um, Affirmations around the room, objects that they can hold on to, that they can focus on. What is the texture of this? What is the temperature of it? Is it soft? Is it hard? Those are just good things in general, I think, to have, but especially for trauma, because we're trying to reground someone back into the present moment. Yeah. And so those physical things can really be very grounding, especially if it was a physical thing that triggered it, like a certain beeping machine or a certain code over the intercom. Like I have in the article, I list some of these, these things, Mm -hmm. sounds and smells, disinfectant, you know, that you, you, you feel like you're prepared for all of the actions that could happen. You're prepared to be touched. You're prepared, you know, for a baby to, to come out <laughs> and some of these things that are, that are more obvious, but then these like very small, but very physical triggers mm-hmm. that, that, you know, if, if some of your trauma happened in a hospital and there was a particular sound in that hospital, then preparing for that mm-hmm. um, and to, to combat it with another physical thing, another, a different sound that's more yeah, grounding yeah. for now and not reminding you of the past or mm-hmm. a smell. Um, exactly. I love it. Those are some yeah. great ideas. Yeah. Uh, and if, if I can say in part of the trauma informed work that I'm doing too is what I do with people, no matter what kind of trauma is going on is, and, and, and especially with like grief and loss, we can't always expect what the trigger is going to be. Sometimes we may know, yes, this is going to be the big trigger um, or certain dates or certain um sounds, but we don't always know what may be there and may put us there. So it's saying, okay, how do we identify what's going on in your body and what coping skills do you have that make you feel safe again, that remind you that you're in the present moment, that you're not in that moment again? Um, what are the ways you can advocate or have a person who's with you advocate when you may not feel you know, that you have the words or the power to do so. Um, So it's like expecting the unexpected, but then how do we cope with that when it happens? So there's just a lot of different things that we can do to just, um, you know, identify positive coping skills to help through it and how to manage when those unexpected things come up. Yeah. So you uh, mentioned a birth plan is something that you like to, to, uh, you know, suggest um, to people mm-hmm. and whether, whether you're calling it a trauma birth plan or not, mm-hmm. right? I mean, um, you know, you, well, first of all, I, I always like to recommend a birth class, especially <laughs> <laughs> before, before, before you write a birth plan, because then you might have a better idea of what, what could happen, what, what's, what's going to happen, right? What's an, what are some normal sensations? What does the normal labor look like? Um, you know, what are some things I can expect? And then, and then you, you know, drop, make this birth plan, which, you know, may include um, some information about your particular situation. Or you can just put things on a birth plan that says, I'd prefer not to have cervical checks unless they're absolutely necessary. And do you have to, do you have to tell anyone that the reason that you don't want the cervical checks? Yeah, all, all great questions. And I think, um, you know, one of the first things that I'll say is, no, you never have to tell anyone more than you're comfortable with. Sometimes it's really hard to talk about. Um, and I, I think that, some ways to do that. So even if you put on a birth plan, um, 
uh, yeah, don't do cervical checks unless they're needed. And if they are, let me know first <laughs> and ask me if it's okay. Um, and then privacy will be another big part of it. Um, so I, I will go back to, your, to the, the question I was answering, but it made me think I want to say, you know, knowing that you can say like, I don't want any students or any residents in. I want it just limited to who needs to be there. Um, and then asking ahead of time or putting on there, if you need to be clothed as much as possible, how, what is the ways they can make that that happen? Um, so then going back to the question, I think whether it's just in labor and delivery or if you're working with someone ahead of time that you can say things like, I just want to let you be aware I do have a trauma history. I'm not really able to go into a lot of details of that right now, but I just wanted you to know so that, you know, you can be aware. And here are some things that um, I'll be putting on my birth plan that will try to help, you know, you remember that or help us work around it. Um, if you're ever being asked for specific details that you're not comfortable with, then you can say, again, I don't, I don't feel like sharing specific details, but what I do know is these are my trauma responses. I tend to, um, freeze or I tend to withdraw or it may look like I'm zoning out or I may get irritated or angry. Um, so that could be another reason to work with someone too, is you can start to identify what are your trauma responses and then you can let providers know that. Um, that's the other thing when I'm, I'm training people like providers that are working is what are you looking for that might indicate someone has had trauma and when you don't know it. And sometimes, again, that may look like someone who's being angry or defiant or not, you know, com you know, compliant. And really, is it is it a way of them just trying to feel like they have some power and control and that they've been, um, you know, traumatized in the past, especially when I think about um, when I talk about racism um, and the chronic stress around that. Um, someone may constantly feel like they're not being listened to or heard or taken seriously. Um, and that may be misconstrued by a lot of people as like noncompliance when really that's a survival mode. Um, so, so the more we know too about um, like having some good cultural awareness and good cultural humility is, you know, knowing like, what do I need to be sure that I'm portraying that I'm not, again, re-traumatizing someone's racial discrimination. Yeah. Um, so I thought that was important to note too, but I know I probably just like talked about a lot of different things. <laughs> I don't answer the question of like, do you have to talk about it or not? Um, no, absolutely. You do not have to share everything. Yeah. And I mean, could it be helpful to mention that, that you have a trauma history? Um, for a lot of care providers, I would I would say you're you're right. It's probably a good idea to say something mm -hmm. if you can. But if you can't mm -hmm. even manage that much, that's also okay. Yeah. Yes. Um that that you can just list your preferences um on your birth plan without explanation. Um it really no one should require explanation for you know, some basic preferences regarding your, your labor and birth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Wouldn't it be great if everyone did kind of have that trauma informed mindset and just know, like, yeah. that's just how we're going to roll with everyone. <laughs> Cause it would, it would probably be really helpful. Yeah. And again, too, if you are a type of person too, who's very aware of it and, and likes, you know, to share and you find it healing or you find that that helps you feel more like power and control by sharing. Um, don't ever feel afraid to share your story if you want to. Like, um, yeah, I know we don't always know who is going to be good and receptive to, to what we're saying, but you always have a right to, to share your story. Yeah. And I imagine it could be helpful in a lot of ways to do that um, for you and for, for the provider and for other people following you. Yeah, um, yeah. So yeah, good reasons to do it. Good reasons not to do it either way. Um, okay. So when, when someone, let's say, you know, things don't go perfectly um, and, and during either, you know, prenatal care or labor and birth or postpartum recovery, someone is 
triggered, re-traumatized. Um, what are some of the typical, like you said, some, you know, a lot of people will understand their own responses mm -hmm. and, and, and the kinds of feelings and behaviors that will come up for them. But what are some of the more, and you kind of touched on it a little bit, but some of the more common signs yeah. and symptoms. Okay. So some of, when we, you know, a, a lot of times when we think about trauma, we can go into what we think of like a, a combat um, veteran going through is like this, all of a sudden they're so traumatized and they're in a flashback and they're just like, um, you know, reacting in a way that we're like, what, what's going on? They're acting as if like, you know, um, bombs are going off again and they're seeking shelter when it doesn't seem like there's anything else wrong or going on to, you know, to other people. Um, that can definitely happen and it can also be more subtle. So in ways of like, I'm just kind of frozen and I can't really make decisions and I, and I don't know what to do. And I feel really scared all the time. So, um, as I I'll go through specific symptoms, I, I do want to say this is, um, trauma that you've had before or any trauma you might experience birth trauma, um, in the delivery or postpartum definitely increases chances of experiencing postpartum anxiety, postpartum depression. So um, that might be another thing to look out for. Or if you find yourself where you're like, I have symptoms, I am all of a sudden feeling really, really anxious and or really, really depressed experiencing any of those, the postpartum anxiety or depression might be, you know, going to a provider, of course, to talk about it. But that would be a question I'd want to ask too. If anyone is like, did you go through any trauma or have you experienced trauma? Because maybe it is, it's stemming from trauma. And then those are the symptoms that you're coming out with is like depression and anxiety. So they can go hand in hand. Um, but other things when you are able to sleep, because <laughs> right. Sleep is like one of those things, like what is this? And in, in that initial postpartum, if you find yourself having sleep disturbances or nightmares or just bad dreams, that um, either they can make you think about, they can be just replaying the traumatic events or they can just be really scary in general and you don't really recognize the content. So flashbacks, that being like, all of a sudden you're feeling like you're in another time when the really scary or traumatic event was happening and you're not able to tell the difference. So it, it, all those things, again, like we think about the, the combat veteran who all of a sudden is just seeing like, all of the, the war zone around them again, even though they're not in it. Um, intrusive thoughts or thoughts that keep coming into your head that either remind you of the event or something really bad um, that might be happening. So people can be really fearful of their future and they look ahead. You, you might ask that a person who's going through trauma, like, how do you feel about your future? And they're like, I can't see the future. I, I don't even know. Um, and everything just feels kind of doom and gloom. I don't think of, you know, I'm ever going to be safe again. Um, when people's sense of safety has been shattered with trauma, I mean, that that's really hard to cope with. So they may always be on guard or hypervigilant, you know, always like can't really let their bodies relax or, you know, always, but this, if I don't do this, then this will happen. So I have to be sure, you know, um, that I do this or I have to think about it over and over and over until, um, you know, it, it feels right or that I can prevent the bad thing from happening again. Um, so, and another thing that may come up for some people too, um, either related to trauma or just on its own would be like postpartum OCD, obsessive compulsive disorders. So again, trauma has a lot of these symptoms that mirror some of these other things. So we'd want to go get them checked out to see where we feel they may be, like if, if it is OCD, there may be different treatment approaches we would have for that. Um, but it's just like, yeah, every, there could be a lot of um, people who just feel triggered by all sorts of things and all of a sudden aren't able to function in the way that they normally would. So they may do things like, again, freeze, zone out, they may start getting like um, very irritable and seeming like they're kind of fighting back with a lot of things, or they may just avoid situation completely. I got to run away. I can't do any of this, you know, and then shut down. Um, other things, feeling a sense of unreality, just things don't feel real or detached from everything. And people with trauma often feel extreme guilt 
or shame about something, like replaying the situation and being like, I did something wrong. I made that happen. Um, which again, too, feelings of shame and guilt can come a lot with depression. So going to talk to someone to help you sort through what it might be would be helpful. Okay. And so speaking of getting help to sort through those things, um, what kind of help is out there? Um, especially, you know, I mean, Globally, if you want to go that far, but then locally, we're in the same area and a lot of you know, my students um, and people who will watch and read this article um, are in the central Texas area. So what kinds of resources are there? Yeah, so of course, therapy. And when you're doing that, uh, finding someone who who expresses like either on their website or when they're talking to you that they're trauma-informed using modalities that are trauma-informed and have perinatal mental health training. Um, there's also support groups, peer support groups, there's therapy support groups in the Austin area. There's a lot of free ones. And then there are some paid for ones. Even there's an organization called Postpartum Support International, and they have uh, groups that meet virtually. Um, want to say like twice a month or once a month and there's specific ones a lot of different ones one that's just kind of a general postpartum some that are around trauma some that are around NICU trauma or military families or grief and loss uh, TFMR things like that so that could be a, a great resource for people who are coming from all over and then I know that some of the doula agencies also have just some support groups. I think that's really helpful too, is to find other people that are going through similar stages uh, that you are. So that reduces the isolation because with any trauma, anxiety, depression, isolation is a huge piece of that, uh, the, you know, thing that comes in that people experience. So when you just have a tribe of people um, and there are some great uh, Instagram accounts, uh, things that you can look into that people are sharing their stories. Always know, go into it with like that trigger warning of what you read. Someone's story might um, feel really hard to see, but there are a ton of people out there that will say, oh my gosh, I had birth trauma or I had trauma before and I never expected this to come up. And just sometimes reading other stories can make you feel less alone. I was thinking too, uh, if you are in the Austin area and you are looking for um, a perinatal trained therapists that we, uh, people gone through formalized training and, and all aspects of it. Uh, the Pregnancy and Postpartum Health Alliance of Texas, which um, I'm a, the clinical director for, there is this awesome directory called Christie's List. And everyone on there is a provider that is vetted. We've, you know, looked at their trainings, what they've gone through. Um, and it has all their information on there. So you can look up and see even based by insurance or area of town or specialties, what they work in and try to provide a provider that way. And we as well have listed some of those support groups that I was talking about and other resources like certain books or um, mental health birth plans or postpartum uh, mental health birth plan to deal with um, or to help. In the postpartum period, there's just a ton of resources on that. So I like to direct people to that in the Austin area as well. I'm glad you mentioned Christie's List. I'm definitely linking to that from the article. Um, it's a great resource um, and, and all of those other things too. And, and the other thing, I don't know, you're going to put my information out there so people can reach and contact. In the future, I do plan on having some trainings that I'll be given and um recording that will be available afterwards and they'll be on topics around like trauma perinatal trauma 101 um other other things all sort of sexual abuse and perinatal mental health so if anyone's interested in kind of learning more about that i know a lot of people that'll be that we're watching this will be um parents and like what we would call clients going through it but if there's any other providers out there that are wanting to learn more about trauma-informed care um there, there are a ton of, and not just me, there's a ton of other trainings out there as well. Um, yeah. People talking about birth trauma and trauma that can come up. So. There are, there are a lot of people looking for that kind of information. So I'll definitely um, add that to you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you being here.